The moment we've all been waiting for, a dry run of the new Kibbe on Liberty has somehow nefariously leaked from the Kibbe on Liberty studios, and we're going to beat the bootleggers. We are releasing this thing, flaws and all. It's crazy. There's cats. There's, there's, there's whiskey. Um, but you know what? That's the ethos, the counter-counter revolution. Kibbe on Liberty, check it out. So Jordan Peterson says, if you see a cat, pet a cat. Really? We're going to go one further, and we're going to have a cat around us at all times because it's going to make our lives bigger and better and richer. Am I quoting Jordan Peterson correctly here? He's, is he a big cat guy? No, he just thinks uh, he. Jordan Peterson has a very dark sense of the world, and he yeah. thinks that the one thing that makes the world better is petting a cat. Well, and he's, he's not wrong. The thing that I've learned from, from now – having a cat in the house is that if they let you pet you pet them take advantage of it because usually they don't want you to well they believe in well the not non- yours they believe in the non-aggression principle <laughs> you, you need you need to really get their permission before you start touching them yeah well i think my dog's like a cat in that way you're not supposed to pet her unless if she's really okay with it Important. how's the cat tail on a mic is how does that, that sound a, like Rourke's much better at staying on mic than you are so far yeah yeah well Rourke's been in the way of the well mic, we're practicing fair and this, this is a little this little, is all for practice little so we can, little we can dead fail. air here we can fail That's a lot better. Yeah. yeah what are we practicing for so so this is the uh loyal viewers of kibbe on liberty have been watching me sort of hit my head. I've gotten a lot of comments, by the way, on the the hitting my head on the stairwell coming up here. <laughs> uh, this is the new Kibbe on Liberty studio, which happens to be in carriage house built around 1860, 1870, about the time that, uh, no, don't do that. <laughs> That's sharp, dude. <laughs> about the time that, that Washington burned down, I guess, I guess it would have been part of the Civil War, I don't remember anymore. Um, and, and this house is standing, and, and we cleared out all, almost all of the garbage. There's still a bunch behind us here. Right. And behind all this garbage is a fairly beautiful old brick structure, which is now the new studio. Yeah, it looks great. We're not done yet. Yeah. Right? We're going to do some more stuff, but we're getting ready for season two. There's, there's still a lot of dust on the floor. And, and, you know, Rourke is still trying to figure out what role he's going to play in this, in this show. But... And I, and I talked about this a little bit, but I think the, the future of social media is less screechy, it's less rage bait, and it's more for people, particularly young people, that are trying to figure out how shit actually works. And, and they, they have this beautiful array of tools where they can, they can find books, they can find YouTube videos, and, and we're going to try to help fill that gap so that if you, if you want to have an adult conversation about something, even something that might make you uncomfortable, like, like immigration, <laughs> That's um, dangerous. There'll, be no, there'll be no screaming unless uh, we're screaming to get a second whiskey. And I should point out that this is a drinking set. So Well, it, it's not a dry set, that's for sure. Dev- well, th- there's going to be, um, be jello shots. For our friends like Senator Senator Mike Lee, right, correct. Um, you don't have to drink to be on this set, and, and we won't judge you if you don't want to. But we're but all if, about free choices here. Uh, this, mm. by the way, I I brought back from the People's Republic of Vermont. Oh. So I should be up on the mic, right? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things we're we're learning how to do right now in <laughs> podcast world is is stay on mics. So Getting up on the mic. Hear us. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, that's good. You know, this is what I actually, I had texted you when I was in a liquor store yeah. buying whiskey for my dad for Christmas. And I said, "What? what's a good one? And this is the exact bottle that I think that you told me. It's the same brand that you told me to buy. And yeah. I can confirm it's good. It's, uh, I mean, this one's actually uh, grown and distilled in Vermont and, and aged in Vermont. Some of the earlier bottlings of, of Whistle Pig were imported I see, you're proving that our table still wobbles buddy um so in case we're wondering whether or not rourke would participate in the new set <laughs> rourke is into the new kol he's uh 
God help us if we have a guest that hates cats because we should probably screen them out ahead of yeah, time. Yeah, we'll just make sure that they're not allergic. But Whistle Pig was like, I think, the first generation of, of American sort of craft distillers outside of Kentucky and Tennessee and, and traditional places. And and they started, because whiskey takes a long time to make, they started by, by sourcing whiskey from Indiana like a lot of others have. Uh, so this is real Vermont whiskey, and it's it's high-quality stuff. It's it's really good. Um, well, so speaking of back, getting back to Kibbe on Liberty Season 2, what are uh, what are we going to do with it? I think we have a lot of exciting stuff in mind, but but what's our what's our plan? How do we want to get the um, get into that the sort of discussion space? Yeah, so we have um, you know we have this 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 new mega platform called Blaze TV, and I'm really excited about you know my my history with the Tea Party. I, I've always worked really well with with Glenn Beck and his crew, and and we did some really cool things back in the day. I, I remember a lot of those yeah, you were actually, mega events. I remember that mega event where yeah. you were actually trying to make the uh, the massive screen work while standing on stage, and Glenn was sort of like yeah. making fun of you. Yeah, the, well, that was the uh, the only time. Um, you know, I think my grandma always thought I was like a super liberal, and she was a big Beck fan. And uh, that was one of those times where I just I took the took a picture with him backstage just to send it to her just to be like, hey, I'm safe, I'm okay now. Yeah. <laughs> so even Grandma signed off on that. Yeah. But but we have this platform, and it's an interesting time that that goes back to the thesis of this show is like a lot of young people are searching, and a lot of people um, I think are what I call liberty curious. They they want to find something different. They're they're they you know they don't want to be either of these these two far out there tribes that are primarily defined about what they hate about the other guys and they're searching and, and social media and YouTube and Facebook and all these things have been great liberators in that sense. Like it gave people access to different types of stuff. You could find different books, you could find different videos, but of course everybody knows about, about censorship on these platforms now and, and they don't, they don't like some of the things that we're definitely going to be talking about. Um, so the, the value of having a platform like Blaze TV is that um, nobody gets to decide what we talk about except us. It's our platform and it will be censor free. Um, all you gotta do is agree that the constitution and the rule of law and human liberty are important things and, and, and you're gonna be on that platform and, and I'm, going to be one of the the token libertarians so we're going to be using the l word here and we're going to say it loud and proud and it's it's going to be cool and we're going to we'll actually go to the furthest reaches of crazy libertarianism we might even let logan express some of his insane views on liberty (laughs) um careful we'll see we'll see we'll see he's maybe we'll sense (laughs) self-censor well speaking of of um of uh some of well we have whiskey but one of the people that we'd like to have on early on and, and uh, would be our friend Denver Riggleman, who we made a, a fun documentary with, which honestly, let's let's be real. The documentary we made was really about Christine. Right, right, <laughs> right. But Denver, our friend who just got elected into uh, into Congress, um, he's going to definitely be an early guest and we're going to have a lot of really exciting characters coming in. Yeah, I mean, we're we're in the belly of the beast this this studio is three blocks from the Supreme Court, and that that really awful noise offset is in fact Rourke the cat, um, just re- eating the trash. Kind of disappointed that we're not paying attention to him. <laughs> um, so we're you know we're we're within walking bis- uh, distance of the House and the Senate and the Capitol, um, which will give us an opportunity to get uh, Congressman Riggleman on. Um, you know some of these these Liberty guys that we love so much, Mike Lee, Thomas Massey. Rand Paul, Justin Amash. Uh, we might even expand it a little bit, but I hope we don't have too many politicians because because I don't I don't most politicians are not willing to speak the truth. They're always on. They're always messaging, and there's there's just gonna kind of be a no bullshit zone. I hope. Yeah, yeah that's true. Well, uh, something that we haven't done, and that I was hoping to do, was. Uh, you know, since we're starting with a clean slate, new season, to talk about why you're in the liberty movement. Because um, 
I don't think we've really tread through your history that uh, that frequently. So I was thinking, how did how did Matt Kibbe become Matt Kibbe? I mean, you started definitely on a different path. Well, I'm first of all, I'm old, so <laughs> I'm a, I'm a lot older than almost anyone I work with, probably anyone that watches this show. I'm not quite as old as Yoda, but I am old enough to remember a time before the internet and before cell phones. Um, if you wanted to find an idea, you had to go to this thing called a library. Um, people don't even know what those are anymore, and maybe we'll have a show about that someday <laughs> to explain how awful it was to, to sort through the cards. How did and the Dewey the Decimal System the, work? Yeah, <laughs> all that stuff. And um, I, I mean, I discovered these ideas reading the liner notes on a Rush album. And even using the phrase liner notes, I'm not sure people know what that is, but it's the notes that came inside of the old vinyl rock albums. It's cool again, I guess, to, to buy things on vinyl. Um, and, and one of the things you used to do is, is read the liner notes when you put that vinyl disc on, because you had to be near the, the phonograph, right? Yeah. People don't know what phonographs are either because you had to flip it mm -hmm. and it just, it was just three or four songs on each side. And I was reading this, this, this album liner notes from Rush. Um, the album's called 2112 and the album was dedicated to the genius of Ayn Rand. And I'm like, who's that dude? I don't know. I've never heard of a dude named Ayn Rand. I'm 13 years old. I, I couldn't possibly know who she was. Um, but because she had a weird name, uh, the name stuck with me. And I was at a garage sale a um, couple weeks, a couple months later. I don't really remember. And I found her old uh, tiny little book called Anthem. And I'm like, oh, that guy, Ayn Rand. Um, I took it home and I just devoured it. And it it, it set me on this course where I started seeking out her books and then I sought out other books by, by Austrian economists like Ludwig von Mises. Uh, it was so strange that before I went to college I had actually read uh, The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. And that's which, like not a not light reading. It's not a light read and more importantly, it's, it's perhaps the worst possible strategy for meeting girls in high school. <laughs> they don't care. No. What are you doing, bud? <laughs> um, yeah, they don't. They don't care about economics. Yeah, and Rourke R clearly doesn't care about Adam Smith either. No. Or my property rights. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I did all that, and and maybe it was a good thing or a bad thing, but be, but I became like a book dork libertarian in high school, and and that's how I ended up here because I. Um, my buddy at Grove City College told me to come to George Mason University um, to get my PhD in economics at George Mason um, in the Austrian program. I never finished my, my PhD because here we were in the belly of the beast and there were so many opportunities to make. <laughs> we're going to have to cut all of this out. Dude, will you sit down? Well, this is what the show is. It's it's it's, it's actually really... about it's 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 about Rourke the cat yeah. wandering into set and causing Oh, there he is. There, there he is. Now he's settling. Yeah, we talked about this before and this was what you were going to do. Well, it's it is kind of cold up here. It is kind of cold. What, buddy? Okay. Oh, that's Are we cute. good. Look at that. Are we good? Look at him. Don't start bumping the mic. So so I'm reading all this stuff. I, I get to George Mason University, and I always call Washington D.C. the Death Star, right? It, yeah. There's there's something about it. Well, back then you couldn't call it that because the movie hadn't come out, right? Well, that's no, 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 no. <laughs> um, Star Wars. When did Star Wars come out? In the '77. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we're talking well into the early '80s yeah. by now. <laughs> How long was your hair at the time? Um, so I had a long ponytail. Is is kind of like a hardcore party mullet. Mm -hmm when I got my first job in Washington, um, but you could tuck it under your collar. Right. So you could, you could be party all night, but during the day you look like a, a regular Republican. Um, I eventually cut that out for both practical and, and physical reasons. Yeah. Now it'd be called what's known as a fading glory, right? <laughs> be sort of a George Carlin mullet. And, yeah. And I don't know. If, I don't Where know. you're just holding on to that last hope. Yeah. I don't know if the wife's going to sign off on that. But I got involved in policy, and um, I don't know if that was a good idea or a bad idea, so I went from wanting to be an academic to working. I was chief economist at the Republican National Committee, 
which was sort of, um, for me, an emotional sellout when I was 25 years old. You still have the card, don't you? I, I still have proof that this happened. I worked at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce as their budget director. So I, I'm sort of emptying my closet right yeah. now in case people want to attack me for being a sellout. Worked on Capitol Hill. And eventually I came around to starting the organization that you knew, uh, FreedomWorks, in 2004. But the idea was like, how do you how do you get people to care about this stuff, like like the national debt and civil asset forfeiture and and government um, doing all of these things that sound so good but turn out so bad? Yeah. How's my mic? You sound great. You sound like Darth Vader. Can oh, you, good. Can you hear uh, Can you hear Rourke purring? No, I can't hear Rourke. Let's see if we can get this into the shot. Uh, don't, don't, don't no. like, don't, don't, no. this is expensive equipment. That means it's fragile. <laughs> this is all our new equipment, which we're, we're, road <laughs> we're testing. also testing that out. Yeah. We're seeing if this is going to work out or not. Yeah. Well, it sounds, I think it sounds pretty good so far, but, um, so, okay. But so you started with freedom works begins, get into the, eventually become into turn into from, from sort of academic and policy into sort of into grassroots organizing and and i i hate the word i don't want to use the word you became a almost a media figure uh, to some extent too which was completely different from from the sort of more bookish end of your career and how how did that and now you're full-blown media figure how does how, how's that how'd that happen so when we were cleaning out um, this area, I found all of my boxes from graduate school, and and it reminded me of this of this evolution. When you're in graduate school, you can write hundred page papers that sometimes have more footnotes than text, mm-hmm. because you're carefully documenting every claim that you make, and you're citing people and all that stuff. and And I was the editor of an academic journal called Market Process, and that was. Um, a outlet that was really designed for dozens of people. If you really rocked it, you could get some important academic to say something nice about a paper you wrote. And, and somewhere I have uh, letters from, from three academics that were heavily influential on me, uh, a guy named uh, GLS Shackle, who was a radical Austrian economist um, with some Keynesian leanings, a guy named Israel Kersner, who is, is one of the fathers of, of the Austrian under, understanding of entrepreneurship, and even James Buchanan, who was the founding father of public choice, they all said nice things about my stuff, and it was such a big deal back then. Um, but then I published my first op-ed in a Wall Street Journal mm-hmm. a couple years later, and I did the math, and I realized, you know, do I want to be talking to a couple dozen academics when I could be talking to a mass audience, I don't know what the distribution of the journal back then was, but it was bigger than 12. It's <laughs> much bigger than 12. Well, so let's back up real quick because you, you mentioned two keywords that that I think come up frequently. Um, and I know we've defined them at some point, but let's define them again. So you said Austrian economics and you said uh, Keynesian, mm-hmm. which I always have a tough time pronouncing. But what are those? I, so um, Austrian economics is uh, boiled to its essence is the idea that the market is this process where you know human beings are acting purposefully in a world where they mostly don't know most of the things that are going on. So it's not this, this rarefied state of equilibrium that a lot of economists like to play in. It's this discovery process where you're trying to figure stuff out in real time uh, go all the way back to the Scottish Enlightenment, and, and they talked about the wisdom of crowds and the way people figure that out. Austrians apply that to all of their economics, you know, particularly microeconomics, economics about the individual, because it's, it's, it's silly to think that we as individuals um, know everything. We don't know everything that's going on in a marketplace, and most economists make that assumption. The, the, the point of that, of the whole process understanding is that without the process, you don't get the knowledge. You don't figure stuff out unless you are people are free to figure that out, which is why Austrians are so libertarian inclined. That's where they got their critique of, of socialism Mm -hmm. because socialism replaced that process with somebody really smart and somebody with lots of power redesigning things from the top down. The, 
the, the Keynesian approach was not micro. It wasn't about the individual. It was macro. And John Maynard Keynes had this idea that you could manipulate human behavior and economic performance uh, basically by spending money you don't have. Right. Um, and, and the Austrians were very much a critic of that. There's a great video of Hayek uh, rapping, debating Keynes. Keynes, right. Classic video. And he's arguing basically that you, you can't manipulate individual behavior like this without all sorts of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And Keynes is rapping, it doesn't matter. I'll be dead by then, so I don't care. <laughs> Just fair. <laughs> so, he, so, so, you know, Keynes, Keynes inspired generations of politicians to do things Who? that that didn't matter to them because they'll be out of office by the time and the shit hits be the fan. Yeah. Um, so to make it about Star Wars, because we, we're in the Death Star and you want to sound like Darth Vader, but if Austrian economics is the light side of the force, which assumes that, you know, sort of it's a free will that kind of stuff the dark side is all about controlling and and making people act the way that they want to is that sort of a yeah there's like the george mason tradition was was twofold and it, it it affects everything that i think about every day and it's it's a fairly useful way to sort of process information and policy when you don't really know what's going on and one was that that austrian idea that unless you let the process work itself out, you don't get at better knowledge, you don't get a better understanding because, because that comes from free people um, sharing their personal knowledge and discovering, making mistakes, um, having successes and, and doing all that stuff that we know people do. The other half of the George Mason tradition was another guy I mentioned, James Buchanan. Can I be taken seriously at all like this? Um, like, really? Yeah, you always have to. I feel like uh, Dr. Evil. Yeah, you <laughs> maybe, we'll, maybe we'll shave Rourke. Yeah. Know. He probably wouldn't like that. Um, well, he'd be really cold that way. So James Buchanan, who is oddly now this very controversial figure on the left. Uh, there's been some just an awful book written about him that, that, from my personal experience, I know to be just completely non-factual. But anyway, B James Buchanan... While I was in graduate school in 1986, won the Nobel Prize in Economics for this really, really deep insight. Politicians and bureaucrats are just as self-interested in you as you and I are. No way. He won a Nobel Prize for that, and it was very controversial. Um, but all of macroeconomics, you know, the ways that, that government manipulates the economy to supposedly enhance economic growth, starting with Keynes, suspended this assumption that that politicians were self-interested and there was somehow this magical process by the time the day you took office or the day that you took a government job you're going to put aside your personal interests and just work in the public interest whatever that is you will I mean, be a servant and it's whatever not that true. is and and it just wasn't true so so buchanan looked at what what i would characterize as government failure the unintended consequences of grandiose policies that that make you do things um, make try to make you do things that you wouldn't do otherwise there's always unintended consequences there's always all sorts of things bad that can happen when you give government that much power and if you take it to an, its extreme and we've done lots of videos about mm -hmm. this you end up with someone like Pol Pot who who went from this sort of gauzy idealized Marxist world into murdering one in four of his his countrymen in less than four years. So that's that's what happens when you have too much power. Um, that was the Buchanan side of things. So if you look at any public policy, is does that guy know enough, and is he actually good enough to give that much power? You you pretty quickly get to a point where where limiting power and limiting exotic schemes to redesign the economy are just common sense. Um, okay, so so I want to talk about the tea party days a little bit because um well one it's when i come into the picture so that's really obviously important that's really today. the beginning uh, of this whole but two i think that you know obviously with the blaze tv and i think with our previous part partnership with crtv um and just with the freedom works you know obviously there is a history with the tea party and i think that that it's important to sort of dissect that moment a bit um what do you think about where it went and how it was? So to 
and if you don't mind, I'll go back to that whole story about, you know, I was talking about the first time I wrote for the Wall Street Journal, which, which was the moment I decided not to be an academic and to try to translate economics into plain English to try to reach a broader audience. And, you know, eventually I would get to this, this organization called Citizens for a Sound Economy, which in some ways was the, the precursor to FreedomWorks. And the idea was always to try to figure out a way, reading all this leftist literature about, about community organizing. We're, we're, we were reading Alinsky um, probably when Barack Obama was still in high school. I'd have to do the math on that. He was uh, smoking pot in high school. Yeah, when he <laughs> not that there was anything wrong with yeah, that. Yeah, when he was actually. when he was going all Elon Musk and <laughs> and burning fatties and and reading a reading Saul Alinsky, um, and we're trying to figure out a way to get uh, libertarian, classical liberal, constitutional conservative, get these ideas about limited government and make them popular and engaging as a social movement. Like like how do you get people to care about this stuff? Because the classic dilemma for limited government is that you don't really have an incentive to show up to keep regulations down, to keep marginal tax rates down, to keep spending down in particular, because is it, is it really going to impact your life in a, in a substantial way that justifies schlepping all the way to Washington to, to, to march or meet a congressman or all that stuff? And so we're trying to make it easier for, for that cadre of people to get together and have an impact on the process. But, you know, fast forward to FreedomWorks, uh, which, which I founded in 2004, um, it really didn't happen until technology and easily accessible social media technology. Nothing like we have today, but, right. but stuff that actually worked. Um, when that met the perfect storm of the Tea Party, it, it wasn't just a profound social movement. It, it fundamentally changed politics and the way that policy is going to be made forever. And, and, and you know, FreedomWorks was, uh, we actually did a, a little strategy paper looking at the Boston Tea Party as um, purely strategically, as, as a platform for, for communicating ideas to people that didn't care that much because mm -hmm. that's what the Tea Party was. It was a carefully orchestrated event that was specifically designed to reach that third of the public that John Adams always complained about the the people in the middle. Right. So, so you had, the squishy meat middle. <laughs> so you had uh, Rourke is going to want like a heated seat next time we do. Yeah, this. we're, we're going to need to triple up the space heaters. Um, and I always butcher the quote, but John Adams said um, uh, the the colonial public around the time of, of 1774 was one third patriot, one third in the tank with the Tories, and one third gettable. And that's a completely butchering of the quote, but he did say the third, third, third thing. And the Boston Tea Party was a public demonstration. It was a nonviolent public demonstration of, of, of what the the British government was doing to people and their tea. And it wasn't just about taxes, it was about trade and all sorts of things. And so we were trying to figure out a way to do that, having studied Alinsky and the Boston Tea Party. And by accident, we, you know, we, we happened to be there when, when the Tea Party started to emerge spontaneously as a grassroots movement empowered by technology. Mm -hmm. So I think the thing that's interesting is that the Tea Party party happened a moment in that moment. You had Occupy Wall Street, which sort of existed but fizzled out, I, I think, relatively quickly. But I think we've now passed these moments of these sort of organized political movements because everything, like the word that you like to use, is disintermediated. disintermediated. Everything's kind of spread out so much where you can't, you can't, you, there, there's sort of pockets of, of uh, everywhere. So where do, where are we doing now, and what what changed from those grassroots day, roots days? So the you know the 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 difference is that the Tea Party and the Ron Paul movement and Occupy Wall Street and even even like the Women's March mm -hmm. and, or Black Lives Matter, Black Lives which, Matter, which now seems the thing of the past, the past almost. But you know the. The more sustainable movements, and I, I would argue 
you know, Ron Paul was, uh, the Ron Paul movement was sustainable, but it was very dependent on Ron Paul. Um, the Tea Party movement was sustainable, even though there wasn't a Ron Paul. And that's because there really was, uh, at least from, you know, in the first four or five years, a, a set of values that held it together. Uh, limited government, fiscal responsibility, and personal liberty. You could walk into any Tea Party crowd and they'd say the same thing. The problem that the left has, um, the problem with Occupy Wall Street is that there was this broad array of values and agendas um, that was really just a, a collection of, of one thing they were pissed off about, but they didn't have a, a set of values that held them together. The Women's March is sort of disintegrating as we speak, and it's the same problem. Everyone was there for a different reason, except they don't like Donald Trump. That's not enough. That does not sustain a so social movement. But I, I think, I think the, the reason we're doing what we're doing right now, and the reason we created Free the People together is that this isn't a this is not a cadre building exercise anymore. We're not trying to find all the people in America that that share those three values of individual liber liberty, fiscal responsibility, and and limited government. We're trying to reach almost everybody. Like and and social media allows you to do that, and you can make it easier for people that would be interested if they knew to find out. Yeah. Because it is an extraordinarily expensive big ask to, to ask people to drive across the country and march on Washington. And if, if, you're, if your goal is to get a lot of people to do that, you're going to fail because normal people don't do that. And I say that as an abnormal person. I, I'm extremely abnormal. Normal people have families and jobs and kids and they go to the game on Sunday, and, and they probably go to Bruce Springsteen concerts if, if they have any sense at all. Absolutely. <laughs> By the way, Ter icon. Terry, Terry's like, uh, who's the big man? She oh, did not she did know, know who the big man oh, was. Clarence Clemens. Uh, of course. I mean, of course. Every, every person worth their salt knows who the big man is. Absolutely. R.I.P. Um, yeah, do we need a moment? <laughs> Just a silence. Are you going to get quick. emotional? Uh, no, we're not, we're not listening to the, on Broadway soundtrack yeah. but well actually so since you brought up the boss um you know he uh he sort of very um vocally got upset about the border situation uh he even added in and i disagreed with this move but he swapped in the ghost of tom Joad and uh long time coming into his much acclaimed Broadway run in, in place of uh, Long Walk Home, which I thought is actually the, his best sort of political music piece, whatever. But anyways, the point is, he made a big stink about the whole um, what's going on at the uh, at the border a while ago, and there's been a lot of press about it. And I think that that especially people on right of center, um, you know, there is a lot of confusion because there is a rule of law aspect to to the sort of immigration crisis, if you will. Um, and then there's also the question of what is the wall necessary, but where do you come down on the immigration on, on this massive debate that's happening? Right it's, now? I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such a complicated debate. And, and I think, um, I, I think at least reasonable libertarians probably have some, some profoundly important solutions. Uh, and we talked earlier about unintended consequences. Um, the, the, the first thing that you have to sort of do, figure out is, is, is what is the goal of, of, of border protection and immigration policy? And if anybody listening here has the view that, that um, people from other countries should never come to our country legally, I really don't have much to offer you because I don't agree with that. Well, I think, we'd be empty chairs. Yeah, we'd be empty chairs because uh, you know your your I can grandparents reach back came over the boat one generation yeah. or and, two, and mine did as well. Um, and there are some people on the left and the right who don't want anyone to come to our country, um, but I don't have anything to say to them because I just disagree, and and we would just have to have to fight over that as winners and losers. Uh, everybody else seems to agree that the goal of, of border protection and immigration policy is to make sure that people that want to come here and work and follow the rules and contribute 
to American society, there should be a reasonable way for them to do that. Um, and, and if we agree on that principle, um, and I'm not even talking about citizenship, I'm talking potentially about guest workers who could come here and help with the crops mm. and help with construction, which is primarily where, where sort of um, migrant guest workers, illegal or legal, tend to contribute here. Um, if, if that's something that we care about, um, but we don't want bad guys in. We don't want terrorists to come to this country. We don't want violent drug gangs running across the border and, and killing people. Um, here are some solutions, and these, these are hardcore libertarian solutions. The first is to stop the drug war. The drug war and the smuggling of illegal drugs and the gangs that those illegal drug smuggling creates and the guns that they run mm -hmm. in order to protect their illegal drug trade um, this is a source of, of much of the violence and, and much of the problems, not, in, not only on the border, but in our country as well. And, and libertarians don't believe in the drug war. We, we look at the unintended consequences. We look at the violence. We look at the kids that die because of, because of things like black market fentanyl and say, we, we could do better than that. And, and the way you do better is you decriminalize everything. And that sounds crazy to people that wouldn't think about this, but we have an actual example. We have a real world example of a country, um, Portugal, where in the 1990s, they had literally people dying in the streets because of heroin overdoses. Um, it was a drug disease hellhole. Um, and they decided to do something radical in 2001. I don't even know why they decided to do it, but they decriminalized everything in 2001. And if you look at the data today, um, by any conceivable measure, um, things got better. And they got radically better, and it happened quickly. The deaths stopped. They're now um, the safest, as in terms of, of drug deaths, of any country in the European Union. Uh, youth use of drugs went down, not up. And it was all because it was no longer a legal question. It was a, it was a community question. It was a parental question. It was a doctor patient question and people that got in trouble could, could solve that problem. But you also dried up the illegal market. You got rid of, of the gang leaders. You got rid of the adulterated products that would kill you if you took them. Uh, we should do that because um, not only would it be good policy and save a lot of, of, of uh, people's lives in this country, but it would get rid of the drug gangs. It would pull the rug out from all of them, not just on our side of the border, but in Mexico and Latin America as well. Well, and those gangs have contributed to the destabilization of that whole area, which is why so many migrants are coming up this way, correct? Right. I mean, yeah, it's, it's like you, you, t you look at a lot of the things that President Trump talked about. Um, the guns, the drugs, the human trafficking, the infrastructure for all that stuff is because of the drug war. And if you, if you take away the profit incentive to do that stuff, it goes away. I feel like the, the wall has become the sort of the big shiny that everyone wants to argue about. But it seems like that's a more salient point that would actually solve the problem. The wall's like a, a really big band-aid because the people still will they'll still pile up at the wall then. Well, I mean, what, what, what a wall does in practice is it probably makes it more difficult at the margin for people to cross the border. Mm -hmm. doesn't make it impossible, and hopefully everyone realizes that. They're, they do drill tunnels. They do climb over top. By the way, they could swim around the side. There's, there is water. Um, and, but it, it does make um, those people that I talked about that I want to come to this country, mm -hmm. people that want to come here and contribute and work and follow the rules, um, they might turn back. They might not come. But those those gang leaders, they're going to find a way. I mean, right. you've seen the pictures of the tunnels you, and the you saw what the, El Chapo did. Yeah, the the solar the solar panels and and yeah. you know I'm sure there's Barca loungers down there and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Um, the bad guys are going to get through. If you're worried about terrorists, if you're worried about gang leaders, um, they're going to break the laws because that's what they do by definition. But you could chase at the margin some people that that you probably wanted to get to this country legally. And that, that's the other half of this. Like, um, if you're worried about controlling 
the flow of bad people across the border, and the government always has limited resources to do that. Don't you want border security to focus on stopping a potential terrorist? Uh, the best way to do that is to make it legal and rational and predictable for guest workers to come into this country to do work that needs to be done. So um, the devil's ad, being devil's advocate here. Um, <clears throat> Generally, people criticize libertarians and, and the whole mindset of like, oh, we shouldn't have borders. Um, you know, that borders themselves by definition are wrong. I don't think that that's, that's the principle that you're laying out here. Is no, that correct? I, you know, I, I mean, people that um, uh, libertarians talk about open borders. And I, I don't like that phrase because I think it means different things to different people. And it's, it's probably important to be concise in your language. Um, if by open borders, you mean um, a predictable process by which people can be processed. Some people call it the Ellis Island process, mm -hmm. right? Uh, like you don't, you don't want criminals, you don't want people with the zombie apocalypse disease coming into your country. I, I think that's a fairly reasonable thing, and I think it's it's consistent with our with our constitution. And it's also consistent with whether or not libertarians like it or not. There are nations, and they do have borders, um, and and we, we can probably debate about borderless society once we get government spending as a percentage of GDP below 25%. Oh. Um, but, but I think the, 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 the reasonable classical liberal constitutional conservative who wants good people to come to this country and help us grow our economy and all the things that, that immigrant workers have done since the beginning of this country, um, you, you got to have an honest way to do this. And the dirty secret about politics today is that I don't think that um, there, there are virtually no Democrats who talk about actually fixing the process by which people can come here and work. Yeah. Um, they're more obsessed with, with owning the votes of people once they get here and controlling the lives of the people who are, are immigrants in this country. But I also think that there's a there's sort of a subversive side of the of the GOP that that doesn't want anyone else to come to this country. Um, it's it, by the way, it's the Bernie Sanders view as well. Right. Bernie Sanders calls um, uh, the Koch brothers. Um, oh, that's open borders. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, as far as I can tell, the Koch brothers are just interested in in figuring out a way to make the dreamers legal. Right. Well, it seems like the problem is is that that the the right seems to come from come at it from this very strict argument of security, which which is a very broad net, and and we've seen the argument of security used to get us into eight different wars and all this other stuff, right? Um, and the left seems to take this approach of we need to let everybody in type of thing. And they want to ignore the problem that, that has been created by government, which is that there is the process by which letting people of letting people in is such an, a, a quagmire right. that it's it that needs to be fixed in order to actually and deal by with the, the problem. You know, the other thing, and Ron Paul talks about this, and a lot of conservatives talk about it, and Milton Friedman talked about it. Um, you know, open borders are inconsistent with a large welfare state. Um, I don't think the data supports that nearly as much as people claim. Um, I think that people that bust their ass to get here are here to work. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that would be controversial, and there's already somebody writing something nasty in, in the YouTube feed here. But um, if that is a concern, um, fixing our guest worker program, we're not talking about citizenship. We're talking about workers that come to this country and do jobs that are available and unfilled mm -hmm. by Americans. There is a process by which you could do this rationally um, and making sure that they're not legally eligible for all these government handouts. I, I think there's a reasonable way to to create some safeguards. And, and I do think there's some Democrats that want them to have access to all that stuff mm -hmm. because that, you know, all of these government programs are the way that they buy votes. Right. It's just the way it is. Well, I, I have a sort of a question on, on this front is that is part of this also figure out a, a pathway to citizenship for people because i think one of the um you know something that you read in the news is, is especially this is happening in europe with their the sort of all the migration from out of the middle east and leaving syria and all this is that they form 
basically form ghettos in these European countries, and there, there's no pathway to naturalization. Right. And one of the things that America can do that no other nation can really do is that you can become an American. Um, and I feel like the sort of stigmatizing and quarantining people is changing that. And, and it, you're sounding more libertarian than I am at this point. Well, and, and, but I, I even, wonder, Logan, even Logan, <laughs> Logan's agreeing with well, you. Well, because, there. because I, I think that that's a big, a big thing. And one of the, the great benefits of American society is that anyone can with that, with enough time become an American. The melting pot. Right yeah. now, which apparently is an offensive phrase, um, uh, particularly on the left now. That, really? It's fascinating to me, and it, it gets into cultural appropriation, and which stuff. is so confusing. Because one of the, uh, you know, I think that it's a, a, you know, a sad thing that gets lost in this sort of social media age, is is the shared culture. I mean, yeah. the choice is great, and and it's wonderful, but there's almost you sort of there is that American culture that used to be that sort of maybe it was a myth, you know, but but there's less of those things that bind us together. Um, I don't, I don't think it was a myth. And I think the melting part was a big part of that. And I, I think the melting pot worked because everyone understood that they had to work and participate um, and, and create communities. And there's all sorts of clashes that are, mm-hmm. that are documented in some pretty do, awesome movies. But do you think it can work again? Yeah, I, I think, I, I think it can work again and I think it should work again. And I, I think going back to your point, um, I remember the first time I was on Bill Maher, and I assume this video still exists somewhere. They do this thing called After Hour with Bill Maher, where it's just a it's it's just a live stream thing, mm-hmm. and and we were talking about um, um, we we're talking about France and and the haves and the have-nots in, in France, and I use that phrase like mm-hmm. there were there were two types of people in France. And this is when the, uh, all the Muslim kids were burning cars right. and protesting a long, a long time ago compared to before all of the horrible shootings and stuff. And I said, well, you know why that happens. There's, 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 two, there's two cultures in France. There's the haves and the mm-hmm. have-nots. And everybody started screaming at me because I was the Tea Party monster uh-huh. that I had no right to talk about the haves and the have-nots. But in closed labor markets, where unions control everything. Mm-hmm. France is a classic example of this. Sweden is, is like this. Um, the immigrant kids have no way of getting that first job. So the unemployment, I don't know what it is in France, I, th- I bet you it's over 50% for this demographic. They have no way to integrate. They have right. no way to, to, to provide for their families. And eventually they get pissed off, but it has everything to do with closed labor markets and high minimum wages and and unions and this is why bernie sanders doesn't want immigrants to come into the country because he thinks that that undermines the union position he thinks it's impossible to impose 15 dollar an hour minimum wages if if someone is coming in that's willing to work for half that yeah well and you it turned out that you were completely ended up being completely correct that that have and have not situation has played out in very violent ways. And, and I mean, France, they've been going through more riots and protests lately too. Right. And, but it goes back to economics and it goes back to regulation. I I don't think it's about immigration. I don't think it's about stopping people from other countries to come to those countries because there's a reason why the migration happens Mm -hmm is uh, the, the populations, the, the, quote, native populations in places like France are, are, are shrinking. No. People don't have as many kids. And, and one of the reasons they don't have as many kids is because there's no mobility, there's no, there's no job growth, and, and you, wouldn't, you, you wouldn't want to do that. Um, so it, one of my buddies um, who runs a little think tank in Sweden has proposed abolishing the minimum wage as a way to allow um, new workers from other countries to get jobs. Because, mm-hmm. you know, they, they probably don't speak the language. They probably don't have a lot of job skills, but how, do they, how are they going to get them? Right. They're going to get them on the job. You can't expect people to, if there's no paths open, like, right. you can't expect them to just magically work things out. But this, but this is where some people on the right and some people... 
uh, like Bernie Sanders on the left can agree because they have this this zero sum, even negative sum game view that every job taken by an immigrant is one less job for us. And that's not how the economy works. I don't think that's true. Jobs and workers create more opportunities. They create more wealth. They, they create more investment in technology and everybody wins. But if, if you can't get a job, they, they become burdens on society. So let's sum up immigration and the wall and all this. So the ideas are people need to be able to become legal or at least get a worker permit or whatever. We need to end the drug war. And was that it? I, is I, that, are those the main two points? I mean, if we could do, if we do one of those things, you would get rid of uh, 99% of the illegal traffic on the border, which would free up border security to focus on, on bad guys trying to get across the border for bad purposes. There it is. There, we solved it. Yep. <laughs> okay, wrap right, this up. That's because it. I am I'm really freezing cold. my ass yeah, off. Yeah. Uh, we need to go inside. Yeah. So, um, well, let's just end with this so people can expect to see Kibbe on Liberty season two pretty soon. Uh, it's imminent. Yeah. Um, and if it doesn't happen almost immediately, I'm going to ask people to direct their angry comments at you. Yeah. Well, okay. Let's also tease out. We have some other fun stuff coming. We have season two of the Deadlyisms. We have some more, some more stuff with beer. Yep, we're gonna do more beer stuff. Uh, We've got a new show with with our friend Denver about his experiences as a first year congressman. You don't even know this, but Thomas Massey invited us back to the farm. Oh, good. To see what else is going on. I need on to there. go get some more, more, uh, some more cattle. Yeah, some beef. His stuff was real good. Some beef. Um, and we're gonna be doing a project on restorative justice. Yeah. And and we promise, I'll promise here, um, unlike the first season of Kibbe on Liberty, we'll come up with some really um, empowering closing statement yeah. so that you know the show actually ended. But for now, <laughs> cheers. We'll come up with a tagline. Cheers. cheers. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. Make sure you subscribe. You don't want to miss a single episode. Click the bell so that you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty Mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.